Hi. Welcome back, guys. What happened? Did we pass the drop date or something? And <laughs> the class shrunk. Well, it's good to see you, the ones that are here. Um, today, uh, I want to talk to you guys about a concept that uh, was fairly instrumental in my own career, which was the idea of generalization. The idea that uh, when you look at a biological system and you see how it learns, can you say something about the region of the brain that might be involved in learning that's taking place. And the mechanism by which uh, um, we made progress was toward this concept of generalization, which means that uh, you know, the learner is learning from error, makes a guess, sees an observation, forms an error, updates his belief, and then you look to see how does he change, he or she changes his belief, his or her belief about other things that it hasn't seen. And the way it generalizes says something about the shape of those basis functions. And uh, those basis functions are what was interesting to us because we wanted to say something about different parts of the brain. Different parts of the brain have different kinds of basis functions. And so can one make estimates of what part of the brain is being used? So um, to start out, uh, there was one thing that I remember from yesterday's, uh, on last week's lecture, that I, that I wanted to go back to because I think it's an important idea that uh, um, you may want to know since many of you guys will decide to take your um, oral exams with me when you want to pass your uh, qualifying. So I want to I want to distinguish between two concepts with you. Um, when we have a random variable x that's made up of x1 and x2, each one a random variable, when we say what's the variance of x, well what we do is that we find the variance of x1 plus variance of x2 plus 2 times the covariance of x1 and x2. And this is something that um, uh, we've described. And, uh, but that's very different than writing a probability distribution that's made up of two different distributions. So for example, on, on last week we talked about having a probability distribution, p of x, that was made up of rho 1 times a normal distribution with some mean mu 1 and some variance sigma 1 plus rho 2, another normal distribution with mean mu 2 and sigma, uh, sigma 2. So um, for example, you know, we have a distribution that looks like this, right? So here, what I mean by variance is very different than in this case. And just to show you that, I want to go through the math to describe what is the variance and expected value of a random variable that's, des that's described as a sum of two distributions, which is very different than a random variable that's a sum of two different random variables. OK? So let's, let's go through this to understand what this means. So what's the expected value of x in this case? Well, what is, what is the definition of expected value? It's, 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 it's x times the probability of x. And what's the probability of x? Well, it's rho 1 times a normal with mean mu 1 sigma 1 squared plus rho 2. And of course, by this, if this is a proper distribution, this plus this must be equal to 1. Right? So rho, rho 1 and rho 2 are both less than 1, or at most 1, and the other one is 0. So that's what we mean when we say expected value. And because this, this integral, um, uh, I can take the expected value inside and divide it and separate it. What I have is that x rho 1x times um, a normal. So that's just equal to rho 1 times expected value of x, which in this case is mu 1 plus rho 2 mu 2. So that's fine. The expected value of x is just a weighted, um, ex weighted means of these two distributions. What about the variance of x? Variance of x is equal to the expected value of x squared plus 
expected val minus expected value of x quantity squared. So what's expected value of x squared? That's just equal to rho 1 integral of x squared times a, a probability of normal mu 1 sigma 1 squared dx plus rho 2 integral of x squared normal mu 2 sigma 2 squared dx. And this, these integrals are from minus infinity to infinity. And that's going to be equal to uh, rho 1 um, mu 1 squared plus sigma 1 squared plus rho 2 mu 2 squared plus sigma 2 squared. So therefore, variance of x um, is going to be equal to um, uh, this minus this squared. And um, let me just check to see if this, if this makes sense. So if I, if I set row 2 equal to 0, variance of x should just be equal to sigma 1 squared, right? And that's uh, I'm missing a squared here. Let's see. To zero, row one, mu one squared. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. This I have to go check my math. This doesn't. This doesn't quite work out. This seems like those should be squared for this to come out right. Row one and row two need to be squared for it to come out right. Um, but they are not squared here. Row two is zero. Sorry, I'm not sure what's wrong. I don't know why this didn't work out. I have, an, I, have a, I have an issue with my rows. That is true. So then it doesn't matter, does it? Yeah, that's true. No, I, w I was only going to check to see if it makes sense. If, uh, if, if I only have one distribution, then the point is rows 1, so it doesn't matter if it's squared or not. Yeah, uh, well, not five. It has to be less than one. Well, I mean, it can only be a so it, it's not a distribution unless rho is equal to one. Yeah. This is integral has to be one. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it may be right. <laughs> I don't, I don't see. I don't. I, I mean, I don't have. I don't. I don't find an error in it. And you're right. If I only have one distribution, then it's correct. Um, I, I may be right on this. I'm not sure. I checked it before on some, some, some other distributions, and it works. But I was just a little confused here because of um, having a single distribution. I thought, the ro I thought algebraically things would cancel, but of course they don't cancel unless rho is equal to 1, which has to be. Otherwise, it's not a distribution. All right, I will check this, and I will come back to you guys on Wednesday. I think it's right.
but not 100% certain. So anyway, the point being that um, um, when you have a random variable that is a sum of two random variables, its variance is very different than if you have a distribution that's a mixture distribution. And this is a mixture distribution. It's a mixture of two different, two different uh, Gaussians in this case. All right. Um, so let's go back to another thing that we talked about yesterday on, on Wednesday, which was that um, when we looked at the loss function, from the experiments that we saw from uh, uh, that paper, where they estimated the loss function for, the, for individuals, they said that it looked like this. Y tilde to the 1.75. So the error is not quite being squared. It's being raised to a power less than 2. So I want to show you what this means from the point of view of how much you learn from error. And I want to show you that what this says is that your sensitivity to error is particularly large when you have small errors. You learn a lot from the percentage-wise point of view when your errors are small. But when your errors become really large, you don't learn as much. That's what this equation means, this kind of a loss function means. So if we had a quadratic loss function, what it would mean is that I'm going to learn 20% of my errors regardless of whether the errors are small or large. But when I have an error function that looks like this, what this implies is that I'm going to be more sensitive to small errors, and I'm going to discount large errors. That's just the, 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 the intuition that I want to show you guys with this particular um, error function. So what, what this means, of course, is that we're going to look at the difference between y and y hat, and in this case, raise it to some power q. So let me, let me just do this. I'll call this q my. Um, my power that I'm raising it to, and, and suppose that you know, I write my estimates as I have some basis set that is evaluating the input x, and I'm going to sum it up with some weights w to form my estimate y hat. So and I'm going to have my, my learning rule. Um, where let's just worry about the first derivative. Uh, where I have the derivative of the loss. So whatever is my derivative with respect to the w, I'm going to move in the opposite direction with it. So I can rewrite that equation find, it, find this derivative with respect to my estimate, do the chain rule and write it like this. So I'm going to define sensitivity to error as how much I change my weights from before when I made a prediction to after I made the prediction. So I'm going to say w hat of n plus 1 minus w hat of n is the change that I made in my belief divided by the error. So how sensitive am I? to that particular error. I'm going to call this variable sensitivity to error. This change divided by the size of the error that I had. So if I do that, um, yeah? You need to like, take the numerator in a magnitude or something, or just take like, its action? I'll show you. It's going to be a function. Oh, okay. It's going to be a function. Because weight is a vector, y is a, the w's are vectors, y is a scalar. Right. Yeah. So it's going, to be, it's going to be a vector in this case. Um, OK. So that's just uh, equal to this representation, which um, I can analytically find. So the derivative of the loss with respect to y hat is, assuming that I'm going to write it in this form, is going to be equal to minus eta times q times um, its absolute value raised to the q minus 1. Then derivative of y hat with respect to w is this function g vector g of x. And uh, then I have this final quantity, 1 over y tilde. 
So if you look at this, um, my sensitivity to error as a function, this is a vector g, as a function of, I can plot it as a function of my, my particular error size. And you see that it depends on two quantities, error raised to a power q minus 1 divided by error itself. So this, if q is 2, this is just something raised to the power of 1 divided by itself, which means that the sensitivity to error is just going to be constant. So if I plot this quantity as a function of error, for a quadratic cost function, it's going to be some constant equal to minus eta times q for q is equal to 2. But for this particular one, where q is less than 2, what's going to happen is that this is going to be a number that's going to be q minus 1 is going to be 0.75 divided by q. You're going to get a function that looks like this. It's going to be high here, and it's going to fall as y increases. So this is for q is equal to 1.75. And for um, functions that are larger than being raised to a power greater than 2, um, you're going to see uh, things that you know, kind of looks like this. This is q is equal to 2.5. And it's going to be a line for q is equal to 3. So how much you change your weights? for a particular, at a particular x, that doesn't depend on g of x, depends on the size of the error. And as the error size increases, this sensitivity to error decreases for the particular function of 1.75. they should like over there and they had a huge error. Wouldn't that uh, correspond to a big uh, change in their behavior? Yeah. So a big error should uh, like force them to change a lot of uh, their uh, right. predictions. Right. Right. But what we're talking about is that as a ma as the magnitude of error increases, do you learn the same percentage of it? So say that you're going to learn 20% of the error. If the error is this, you're going to change your behavior by this much. 20% of it, say. Now, if the error is small, do you also learn 20% of it? If you have a quadratic cost function, that's what you would do. You always learn the same percentage of it. But if your cost is being a power of less than 2, loss is less than 2, what, what, you actu what, you, what it means is that you're going to learn, as a percentage-wise, a larger proportion of small errors than large errors. Effectively, you're going to ignore very large errors as being outliers. That's what, that's what uh, people seem to be doing as well. Yeah, I mean, I have not read their paper, but I still find uh, all of this information that it might work in this case, but not in another. Absolutely, yeah. So, so the reason why I wanted to show you this is because um, uh, this paper was the, the original paper that described this particular loss function was published in like 2004 or something like that. Then a few years later, we did an experiment where we actually gave errors. We controlled error sizes. Given a particular distribution of uh, uh, perturbations, we controlled the error size. And we saw, we asked, what percentage of each error were, they, were people learning? And what we saw was that they were more sensitive to small errors than they were to large errors, which then made us go back to that study and say, well, that's actually consistent with that study, that the loss function is not a quadratic, but something smaller. It's discounting very large errors, basically. Possibly um, implying that you know, very large errors are unlikely to be sort of your fault, just outliers. So um, <coughs> this idea uh, simply you know, comes from this particular, particular loss. All right, um, let, me, let me switch gears. And um, I want to talk about generalization and how we're going to estimate generalization. And so I want to give you the, the framework that I want to pursue. So I described some basis set, G, here. And this G, we don't know what, what they are. 
all we can see is that the learner makes an estimate. You, 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 know, you, give it a, you, give it, you query the system. You say, x, give me y. And they give you y. You give the truth to them. So there's an error between the two. And so then they, up, you know, they estimate their, their weights. Basically, they change their weights. And the idea is that they will take that error and change their weights everywhere. Not just at the particular x that you gave, but it will affect everything. And the question is, well, how are you going to understand how that information got spread? So you may have only given information to the learner at one particular x, but they will have generalized that to everywhere. And you can't track it. You can only ask them to say, OK, give me your estimate at some other x. So the learner can't tell you everything he knows. He can only tell you what he knows at a particular location. But his model will change everywhere. So the question is, how can one estimate this process of learning from those in, you know, individual, individual questions? How can I ask what these basis functions are, given that I've only been asking them from this location, then that location, and the learner is going to change from every estimate? In every trial, the learner is going to change everything he knows. You can only ask, what do you know at this particular location? Give me y hat for this particular x. As soon as you give the actual y for that location, they change their w's everywhere. Right? So there's no way for you to know what, what that whole system looks like. You only can tell for the particular location. So how can one estimate g's? Now, why is it important to estimate g's? Well, if you look at how biological systems learn, there is consistency in them, meaning that they don't just randomly pick some basis set and then use it to make some learning. They come to the learning problem with a particular basis set, and those seem to be consistent among the, you know, the, the, the samples of the population that you try. So from, the, from that point of view, it's interesting to ask, OK, what can I say about their basis set? And you know, why did they choose that basis set? One, part, one idea being that well, maybe there was some part of the brain that they used, and that part of the brain had receptive fields that had a particular shape to it. And by looking at how that learning was taking place and how they generalized, I can say something about the basis. So that was the idea. So back about 20 some years ago, when I was a graduate student, like you guys, sitting on, an undergrad, I guess, it's sitting, among, sitting in a class, there was this idea that um, if we look at learning, not just from the point of view of the learning curve, but something about how it generalizes, we might be able to say something about what part of the brain is being used. Because we know something about the receptive fields at that location. So that, those are the Gs. What do those Gs look like? So um, a few years later, we came up with a very simple technique to estimate not Gs, but something that's related to Gs, which is called the generalization function, which is the way that information that you got at a particular x gets spread out to the other parts of the model that you have. And that's what we're going to do today. And by the end of the day, what you guys are going to end up with is a simple set of tools that you're going to use. So I'm, I've given you a data set for your homework, where all you have are basically what a learner would have. You have x input, you have y hat, the learner's estimate, and you have error. And you have a sequence of examples like this. And from that, you're going to estimate what the generalization function looks like. How do they learn that experiment? So OK, um, let's, let's try to formalize our problem. We want to say something about g's and what they look like. In the very simple case, you know, they may be narrow, they may be broad. So we have y hat is equal to w transpose, this is a vector g of x, this is a vector g. And you know, we have our, our, um, our, our simple learning rule, which, uh, um, plus if we want to use the newton raphson technique, it would be the second derivative of the loss Something like this. So when we uh, write it in a single trial, it looks like this times the error uh, 
times g of x evaluate at x of n times g transpose of x So this is a vector. OK. Um, I can write the change in my weight vector as this function. So if I now pro project the change in my weights onto the output space, the y space, so now the change in y is going to be equal to change in my weights times g of x. And this is a function. Basically, it says, you figured out this vector, this change in your w, project it onto your g space at any x, and I'll tell you how much your change, um, how much change did you get in your output y. Uh, sorry, this is y hat. So to give you a sense of things, so here's some function that I'm trying to estimate. Here's, here's x. Let's say I ask you now to tell me something at this location, x of n. You say, here's my prediction. My prediction is this, this number here. This is y hat at x of n on trial n. So here's your error. This is y tilde. You're going to learn from that error. And you're going to change your estimate now. Next time, you're going, to, you're going to become a little bit better. Maybe move up to there. So this, is, this difference here is delta y hat in trial n plus 1. But it's not going to just change your belief there. You're going to generalize it to other locations. So if your prior belief maybe looked like this, if this was the function that you that you had before, afterwards, it's going to become different over some space. Over this region. So there is one location where I gave you the error. You're going to change your belief over some particular range over some space. That's what you generalized. And the difference between y in n plus 1 before, after the weights change and y at time n before the weights change is what you generalized, is what you learned, which is this, this quantity. So it's my change in weights times the basis set g that gives me my new y hat. And that y hat now is a function. So the difference between the red and the black is in some region. And that, that's, what I've, that's what I've learned. And the width of that and shape of that somehow depends on what? It depends on these g's. So if I were to write that, so what is this? Delta y hat of x is this function, eta, times the error g of x of n times this normalization minus 1 times g of x. So I'm going to call this term here. Let me, let me write it like this.
this is a function. I'm going to call it b of x and x of n. x is the place that I'm evaluating my new belief. x of n is where I saw the error. So before I started to learn, you asked me to tell you what is your belief about x of n. I gave you y hat, this red point here. Afterwards, you gave me the error, and I learned from your error, and I'm going to change my belief everywhere. So now I get this function. And that's this, this function here. It depends on something that we're going to call a generalization function. This generalization function depends on two things. Where did I see the error? And where are you asking me now to generalize to? X is anywhere along this line. X of n is the particular location where I, um, where I saw the error. So the change in y depends on this generalization function. And that's what we're interested in understanding. How do we quantify, how do we quantify this, um, this function? So any questions before I continue? OK, so you're going to have some data. And you're going to ask yourself, all right, well, how do I quantify a function that looks like this? Well, we need to parameterize things. It's a two-dimensional input space, x and xn. Because you're going to have an input that's going to be, you're going to learn from, and you're going to generalize that to anywhere along this line. So x can be anywhere, xn can be anywhere. So we have a two-dimensional space to represent for our input b. And so I'm going to write my function b of x and xn. I'm going to write it as a matrix. And this matrix is going to have rows and columns, b11, b1 size p, and bpp and bp1. It's going to be some numbers there. We're going to have to estimate what they are. And what is, what is the, um, the, the rows? The rows represent the quantity x. The columns represent the, col the quantity xn. This is xn tells me the location where I received the error that I learned from. x is the location where you're asking me to generalize to. So to describe this, what we're going to have to do is take my input space, take input space x and divide it into p equal no, uh, locations. So we can just digitize, digitize your input space into p different places. And if you do that, um, what you can then do is that you can write your y, y hat, at some time point n as a vector. This is a function that is evaluated at uh, any one of those uh, locations. So this is y of x1 of n, y of xp of n. So take my function there. I just divide it up so that at any particular x that takes one of p values, I can tell you what y is. And by a generalization function, what I mean is this matrix. A matrix that tells me if I were to experience an error at a particular location x of n, what fraction of that error will I generalize to any other location p? And we're going to have to try to estimate that from the data. So let me show you, let me show you how to do it. Um, suppose. I define a vector k to be made up of uh, p elements, only one of which is a 1. This is going to be a, this is going to be a row vector that's going to select the location p, or location i, let's call it, where input x is queried. So 
somewhere along my input space x, you're going to ask me to make a guess. And that location is going to be the location where this k selector is going to have a 1 in it. Everything else is going to be 0. So what that means is that um, when, I ask me, when I ask you to tell me y hat at trial n, what you do is you take k and you multiply it by this uh, vector y hat of n. So this is a scalar. This is your guess in trial n. Let me write it like this y hat of x of n. You're going to take this matrix, th th this vector, and multiply it by this, and that's going to give me you know, your estimate of your output at that particular location. What I want to do is to, to show you how we can, we can estimate this matrix from the sequence of uh, data that you have. And the idea is as follows. You have a guess from the learner at a particular location. Then the next time you're going to test them this location, that location, this location, that location, and so forth, until at some other time point later, you're going to come back to the same location. During these periods of asking to make guesses, the learner is learning. The learner is learning from this error, from this error, from this error, so forth. And each time he's learning, he's generalizing to this location. Each one of those generalizations is a number in this matrix. So all you have to do is to keep track of the places that you've asked the learner to guess and the errors at each one of those locations. And what you end up with is a single equation with the unknowns being the elements of this matrix that are the distances to the location where you asked. So you get one equation with as many unknowns as the number of places that you asked. Then you do it again. So every time you come back to a same location, you have one equation which is composed of all the generalization in between the two trials. In trial 50, you're in location here. In trial 59, you come back to this location. In between, you were in some other places. Those places all contributed to what the learner knows in this trial. So the change that took place from trial 50 to 59 are a sum of all these generalization in between. That's one equation with nine unknowns. In trial 51, you were over here. And at trial 73, you come back to that location again. In between, you have all those generalizations that took place. You have another equation with a bunch of unknowns. So we end up with many equations and far fewer unknowns, as long as we have a space that can be quantized in this way so that we come back to that location over and over. And by keeping track of that, we end up with a set of equations that we can solve. And we, we end up with um, our estimates of these b's. So um, it looks like this. So on trial k of n, you have the same thing at trial k n plus m. So in trial k, I'm at some location, and then m trials later, I come back to the same location. Okay, in x space, I'm asking you again, what is this? What, what do you know at this particular location? So, my y hat sub i of n is k of n uh, y hat of n ith element of this. Of this, of this vector is chosen by the selector matrix, selector vector k. My error is y of n minus y hat of n sub i. Then what I learn, y i is equal to b i comma x of n times my error. And then similarly, yi of n plus 2 minus yi of n plus 1 is equal to bi x of n plus 1.
And if I continue with this, I end up with yi of n plus m minus So if I sum these equations up, what, I, what you will see is that these, these things cancel. What I end up with is this minus this, which I will write here. So yi of n plus m minus it's going to be a sum. B of uh, this is a, this is one equation with n plus m minus one unknowns. The change from the estimate after m trials before you had learned it, the change from n plus m to n is the sum of all these elements of the generalization matrix times the errors at those locations. So you just keep track of the errors. You keep track of the elements of the matrix that are describing how you generalize. And that should be equal to the change in your estimate at those locations. Yeah? What are you indexing y with again? So our, our representation of y is a vector. So on any, on any particular trial, I can ask you, tell me what you know about this location. Right? But in fact, what you know is a whole vector. You don't, you don't just know one location. You know it everywhere. right? So yi means at that particular location associated with x, the element yi. It's, either, it's one of these guys here. So basically, you're treating like, well, you're, you're treating y as a function that you've now discretized. Yes, right? exactly. Exactly. That's what that means. Okay. Right. Yes? Um, the, is M arbitrary? M, M is arbitrary. It's as long as lo you've learned from. As lo that has come back to some initial location. So, okay. 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 So, all right. The key assumption here is this that at N and N plus M, K is the same. Uh -huh. Which means that whatever discrete space you have, if you're here to begin with, at some point you return to it. Why is that necessary? Because, because um, uh, yeah, the reason is because you don't know any of these intermediate elements. You only know the beginning and the last one. So why is it that you don't know the intermediate elements? Because you know, I've asked you, so in trial n, I asked you about this location. In trial n plus 1, I asked you about this location. But my equations are all written about this equation, this location. So in trial n plus 1, I ask you about here. But I'm keeping track of what you know about here. I can't measure it until I come back to it and I measure it again. So you can only measure the outputs yes. on Right, from. right. Does, does, does that make sense? So, so, why, you, so why couldn't you just probe the? Because, the, the, because then they learn from that. So, so as soon as. OK, so I'm assuming that you can't do that. Okay, right. right. So a real biological system, as soon as they make a guess, the environment gives them the truth. Right. So good point. We're making the assumption that the learner will learn everywhere, even though you gave an input to one location. And you cannot know anything about what he's learned except at the location where you've asked them to give you a guess. Okay. Yeah. So uh, why is it always like a fixed you know, length m to return? Why m can change. Yeah. I mean, it's arbitrary. It doesn't matter. So but you, as long as you come back to it once. Like yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah. It's just a random sequence of guesses that okay. you're asking them to do. Right. OK. So why was this cool? All right. So um, in 1991 or something like that, uh, uh, one of my professors, his name was Tommy Poggio, he um, used this idea, not this idea the way I've written it for you, but the idea of generalization to make a guess about a specific kind of learning. And here, here was the experiment. 
So what they did is, um, I'm going to erase this. So what they did is that they had people look at what are called verniers. And what, what that means is that you look at a grading that is, this is something like, I think the distance between these is something like, I think, two or 20 second arc. So it's tiny. And you're looking at this tiny difference between these two lines that are like two and a half meters away. And you ask the person, is the top line to the left or right of the bottom line? And they will make a guess. And the, the, these lines are so close to each other that they're a fraction of the size of the photoreceptors in your eyes. So it's like impossible to be able to tell it. But the person is learning from every time you give them a feedback. So you ask them, is it to the left or right? And they say whatever, and you say, it's actually to the left. So then say, okay, to the left. And then they do it again, and they do it again, okay? And what happens is that trial after trial, the performance actually gets better. So, you know, so correct, percent correct. And it's always these vertical lines. And then what they did is that they said, all right, after some period of learning, so this is vertical lines. We're going to stop the learning. We're going to now ask you, can you do it now if I do it, do it to you this way, horizontal verniers? And what they found was that they could not do it. They were back to being naive. So they could not generalize. Okay, so Poggio um, suggested that the way the learning was taking place was with these basis sets that had receptive fields that were basically quite small. So he, he wrote up this problem that said, I have some basis functions, and my, my basis functions have receptive fields that are about the size that I'm drawing here, which are about the size of photoreceptors. And he said that if I had basis sets that like this, I could learn how to do this using you know, that kind of a function up there. This is just some of uh, uh, some basis functions, w transpose times g of x. Each one of these is my g of x. And after I learn it, if you now ask me to do this task, I'm no better than naive at it. Because my receptive fields could not generalize to this horizontal. And you know, from this, in that paper, they postulated that what was happening was that the receptive fields were very small, close to what one might find in the primary visual cortex. This is in comparison to large receptive fields that one finds in higher visual areas, like you know, um, more, more closer to the frontal lobe. So in that paper, they said, look, by looking at the way people learn this task, we can have a sense that the fact that they don't generalize is telling us something about the shape of these basis functions. And they thought that the basis functions must be quite small. The receptive fields must be quite tiny. And that would be consistent with what you might find in the primary visual cortex. So this was about 1990. Now, what, what happened later um, in my own work was that we were looking at generalization of movements. And we sort of developed these equations to estimate the shape of the generalization function. And we moved from this visual domain to a different domain, which had to do with reaching movements. And so in, in the case of the reaching movements, what we began to study is how people learned when they made a movement and they had an error in their movement. So here was the error. Some force perturbed their arm. If you look at the next time that they moved, they got a little bit better. The force that they estimated was smaller. And then with training, they got better at this. And what was interesting is to ask now, what did they generalize to these other directions of movement? So if they acquired some model of these forces and they learned to estimate those forces, we could estimate how much they learned and how much they generalized to these other directions. And using a similar uh, scenario as you see there, we estimated that the basis functions were like this. They had a shape that had, there was a two-dimensional basis set, and if I were to draw them 
the shape of this basis function, it seemed to have some peak here, and then a smaller secondary peak here. So it was bimodal. It has a small peak like this and a large peak like this. So it seemed to learn a lot in one direction, but also generalized a little bit to the opposite side. This was a two-dimensional basis set, like the one that you see over there. And based on this, we said that, look, it seems to us that the basis set that people are learning from in the, this task has a shape that looks like this. And then a few years later, people looking in the cerebellum of monkeys found that the coding of the, the receptive field of the Purkinje cells for reaching movements had this bimodal shape to them. So anecdotal, perhaps kind of interesting, and we know the task depends on, this particular task depends critically on the cerebellum. Patients that have cerebellar damage can't learn the task. And the generalization function that we drive through this process here had this bimodal shape to it that seemed to be consistent with what they found in the cerebellum. Okay, I'll stop for now. Um, do you have any questions? All right. So the basic idea is that by keeping track of the errors and the inputs and the guesses that the learner makes on every trial and fitting it to basically a linear set of equations in which you have a set of unknowns that estimate how you generalize from any location to any other location, you'll end up with a set of equations that should be able to estimate the generalization function. That won't tell you the basis set, but it'll give you something pretty close. OK? All right. So you have a homework that's like that. Thank you very much. <laughs>